Um, hello everyone, nice to be here. Thank you, it's my first eSports bar, so I'm very excited. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's been a while since I've been in Cannes. Between 2000 and 2017, when I worked in TV, I religiously walked the quasette twice a year for MIP TV and MIPCOM selling TV shows. I spent 18 years in TV production, helping grow a super indie called Shed Media and I'd previously sold them a smaller production house. We then sold Shed Media to Warner Brothers. Then an entrepreneurial US studio grown from creativity, now Warner Media, owned by telecoms conglomerate AT&T. Ah, no, hold on a second. Now owned by Discovery, a publicly listed international pay TV network. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the changes in media. The global media market and the economics that drive it have been changing rapidly. The highly leveraged titans of global media, Apple, Comcast, CBS, Viacom, Disney, Netflix and Discovery, and the not so highly leveraged Amazon will battle it out to be the winner of the eyeballs. And I've watched the linear TV market, once the dominant force in Saturday night entertainment, limp to keep pace with this change. In 2017, I transitioned into the world of digital, of social media and social video content. And it became obvious to me that the driving force in the evolution of entertainment and content isn't broadcasters or TV producers or even the moneyed SVODs with their superstar lineups and multi-million dollar productions. It's the audience. Content isn't king anymore. Distribution has taken the crown. Technology has enabled a generation born with smartphones in their hands to make choices at a very early age. And their choice is that their expectation is access to entertainment whenever they want it and however they want it. But the entertainment they want isn't single screen, it isn't passive, it's not a lean back experience. The way stories are told and consumed has changed, and there is no going back. Social media studios, digital publishers, digital businesses understand their audience because their very existence depends on them. Audience is everything, engagement, interaction, appreciation, and you experience it in real time. And it's what motivates everything you do, every post, every piece of content, every comment, when you post, what you post. If something doesn't drive audience engagement, you take it down immediately. The key is understanding your audience, an audience first approach, listening and learning. An audience first strategy in TV is an alien concept. Traditional media creates content, and exchanges it for license fees. The relationship with the consumer that gives you back knowledge and data over time is minimal. Digital businesses like to test and learn to get better, an art and a science. This means thinking of media as a service and not just as a product, like gaming in fact. Whereas media companies are selling to the highest bidder and moving on, Digital businesses are living with that audience day in, day out, and refining their content to suit the consumer and the platform they're watching. But what digital businesses have been a little bit guilty of is opportunistically monetizing those consumers in a short-term way, because digital monetization is so fluid and fast-moving. Chasing opportunistic revenue is tempting and can be rewarding, but finding sustainable revenue lines is more important in the long term. The reality is that we still live in a world of TV dollars and digital dimes. And that's why media agencies, the WPP and Omnicoms of this world, haven't quite got to grips with digital yet. It's because their interest in it is purely defensive, keeping hold of the TV dollars and yet wanting to be seen to be dabbling in the fashionable world of digital dimes. The traditional media world has always relied much more on stable revenue streams, creating and selling intellectual property into windows which vary in value or trading airtime. But as the demand and supply of global content has exploded, 
and the way content is consumed and finance has changed, those business models and the institutions that control them are now having to catch up with an audience first or direct to consumer approach. They're rapidly restructuring, rethinking and recapitalizing. Linear TV hasn't quite fallen off a cliff yet because we are an aging population. The average age of a BBC One viewer in the UK is 61 and the UK's main youth channel, E4, has an average age of 42. But linear TV is a product in decline and broadcasters all over the world are now making a land grab for a Gen Z and Gen Alpha audience. In this regard particularly, I think old media is having to learn a lot from the new. A new in which audiences congregate in communities around niches and passion points, both passionate niches like esports and global consumer brands, think friends. A new in which audiences want to be part of a conversation which social media enables a new in which an ability to tap into popular culture in an authentic way can garner real brand loyalty. Netflix gets this. It seeks to make niches global, super serving their audience content to build viewer engagement and stickiness and brand attribution. They understand global, but they also understand that local is key too. Look at the breakthroughs they've made with local language programming, from Money Heist through to Squid Game, two of their biggest breakthrough hits, making niches global. Two years ago, CEO Reed Hastings said in Netflix's shareholder letter, our focus is not on Disney+, Plus, Amazon or others. We compete with and lose to Fortnite more than HBO. And now Netflix turns to gaming. Some might say too late. Can we expect a platform that gives viewers a passive experience to suddenly become a conduit to gaming, the most communal and interactive of experiences? Perhaps they should have bought Discord. And of course, Amazon has been publishing games for a while now. Even Discovery CEO David Zaslav began talking about super serving passionate audiences of superfans when Discovery were making their move into golf via the PGA Tour. Again, finding passionate niches and making them global, building fandom. The language of social media is adopted by the old guard. Old media is really trying. Technology and its evolution has shaped a generation and that generation is now the emergent consumer group driving the media economy. Content is now queen and distribution is king. But having said all this, we're still seeing massive aggregation deals in the media world built around content. But these deals are largely driven by the combined ownership of content and distribution. Some of these mega deals involve current players in the market, Warner Media and Discovery Merger, Viacom and CBS, Amazon acquiring MGM, Sony Pictures buying anime distributor Crunchyroll, enabling it to funnel content from its own animation production arm, giving it the IP and the distribution infrastructure. Roku purchased $100 million of content from Quibi, don't get me started on Quibi. If there was ever a platform that didn't understand its potential audience, asking YouTube's audience to pay for content that resonates less than the content they can get for free. And all the backers of Quibi were legacy media companies. And then other would-be new players like Hasbro buying E1 or Blackstone backing Kevin Myers' Hello Sunshine acquisition. But what's key in all these valuations is the, con is the combination of content and IP and distribution, the duopoly. 
even the music industry is inter interesting again now that di distribution has got involved and made back catalogues available, discoverable, and monetizable. Just look at UMG trading at a market cap of $55 billion, or the biggest private equity houses going big into music libraries. KKR have bought BMG and now have announced a billion dollar fund to invest in music copyright. And this week it was leaked that Blackstone have matched them, joining forces with it, hypnosis founder Merck Mercuriades to launch another $1 billion fund. The global entertainment industry is exploding with capital. And so to esports, in a world where traditional media is clamoring for younger, engaged, loyal, and organically built audiences, esports have them. Tribal fandom is our engine, and ultimately how effectively we build and monetize that tribal fandom is what will dictate our value. In a world where traditional media realizes it needs a direct relationship with the consumer, that direct fan relationship is how all this started. There is no more accessible or democratic sport. In a world where traditional media needs to find and aggregate audiences on new digital platforms, gaming and esports were born digitally and it's where their audience already lives globally. Esports is the perfect storm, a highly engaged, organic, critical mass audience, globally appealing brands, which also have fan resonance locally, a huge funnel of established and emerging distribution platforms, evolving monetization, and currently corporately disaggregated. And that makes it the perfect target for traditional media acquisition in five to 10 years time when the space surpasses scale and cash flow that makes sense for media companies' balance sheets. The esports journey may soon follow the evolution of legacy media and the space needs to prepare accordingly. Esports teams particularly have grown from crowded apartments and volunteers into multi-million or dare I say billion dollar companies. How do we level them up to ensure they're ready for the next stage? I'm no Martin Sorrell, but I've taken the liberty of putting together a list of 10 key things I learned during my years in media that I believe can be applied to the world of esports. Number one and two, own the distribution and the IP. As we've already referenced, the power of distribution and ownership of IP is essential in today's media market. Owning your audience and not relying on the aggregation of third-party platforms is key. Yes, social media is the top of the funnel, but if your audience just exists on those platforms, you do not truly own them. You don't have access to their data, and you're at the whim of Facebook or Google and their rules and algorithms. At Team Liquid, we've developed and launched Liquid Plus, an owned and operated fan engagement platform, our own virtual stadium, if you will, where we own the data. We can gain insights about the audience journey, what they buy, what games they play, who are their favorite players. Not only does this help us understand and better connect with this audience, it helps us to build diversified revenue streams around that audience. In terms of intellectual property, obviously the valuable IP is currently owned by publishers, but the value of the brands of esports teams should not be underestimated. It's marketing 101, build and protect your brand. And of course, be clever and strategic with media rights. At Liquid, we have streaming deals with Twitch and Huya, but with continued international entrance and the movement in the sports, right mar sports rights market towards non-exclusivity, who knows what will make sense next year or the year after that. Number three, culture. 
culture eats strategy for breakfast. Peter Drucker made famous this quote, but in working with many companies that have undergone transitions, startup growth, acquisition, integration, disposal, I found this to be very true. Culture is the part of the success formula that keeps employees motivated and clients happy. As the saying goes, people don't quit companies or leaders, they quit organizational structures and cultures. Number four, acquisitions. Acquire with a plan and not just for revenue. Esports hasn't yet seen the rush to aggregation that is the trend in many other areas of media and entertainment. But that will come. There have been very few acquisitions other than by the listed companies like Enthusiast and GameSquare. It's partly access to cash, partly the access, or availability of time, and the skills required to assess, buy, and integrate companies. But building diversified revenue streams around audience, which is what this industry ultimately requires, will either take time or an acquisition strategy. Acquire with a plan, not just for revenue. Integrate with purpose and care, and do not underestimate the time or the effort that integration will take to be successful. And beware the earnout. It's fine when you're the acquired company, but some earnouts are structured in a way that incentivizes and encourages short-term gain and are counterintuitive to a well thought through long-term acquisition plan. Number five, don't be scared of process and management. People actually want to be managed despite what they say. This is an industry that's grown up with hustle and entrepreneurship, and that's great, but as businesses grow and they're dispersed geographically, they need structure. Teams require management by leaders who are trained to manage, inspire, and lead. Number six, audience first, fan first. Learn the lessons from TV which has ignored and restricted audience engagement. It was only a few years ago when the US's social, uh, sorry, US studio's social media strategy was a takedown policy and a piracy strategy. Gaming and esports are built on enabling fandom and sharing IP. Publishers give their IP freely to platforms like Twitch the opposite of the TV movie and TV studios. Our value is in audience. An organic engaged audience is the most valuable audience you can own. Number seven, content, creativity, and collaboration. Create content that people give a damn about. Give staff the time, space, resource, and social capital to come up with creative ideas. People have ideas, not companies. Number eight, talent, talent, talent. As talent has been a huge driver of value in traditional media, so shall it be in esports. Have a strategy, be authentic to your brand, employ experts, treat talent equitably, and you will see loyalty and the resulting rewards. Try to rip talent off, and you will see the opposite. Number nine, diversify revenue streams, not your business. As I've said, it's key to build diversified revenue streams. The industry is too reliant on advertising revenue. I don't need to tell you that. But beware of diversifying your business too much. Diversifying businesses is mostly unsuccessful and mostly a bad idea for the majority of companies. There are always exceptions, Sony and Microsoft, but the number of failures by far outweigh the number of successes. So as many companies have learned the, the hard way, having built a successful brand in one industry is by no means a guarantee it will produce success in another. Resist the irresistible pressure 
to extend the equity of your brand. And number 10, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Possibly the most important of all these things is diversity. In a pursuit that can bring daily toxic toxicity to certain groups, we need to continue to push, push, push for an industry that reflects both the demographic and the views of society as a whole, that is equitable, inclusive, and representative. And it is currently none of those things. Just look around this room. So long as we advertise for rock stars who live and breathe gaming, we will not even out the gender gap in employment. So long as we give bonuses and pay rises to men who shout the loudest, rather than build in fair appraisal and feedback processes, we will not even out the gender pay gap in employment. So long as we act tokenistically towards women athletes and talent, we will not fix the basic issues in women's sport, which is that the ability to view women's sport controlled by the media and not the competitiveness or perceived competitiveness of the games themselves is the hurdle to the viewership in women's sport. Whether we are putting pressure on media outlets and tournament organizers, whether we are investing in women's rosters, whether we are building mixed teams as an industry, we all need to act. After all, we are a community built on audience, a generation who have grown up with social change and they will not tolerate our failure to do so. Thank you. Hello. Does this work? Yay. Hello, everybody. <gasps> Bain, hi. Many familiar pairs of eyes. Hi, Kim. <laughs> so happy to see you all again. Um, my name is Anna Rosvandovic. I am a co founder and, and co CEO of the Story Mode. Uh, we are an esports communications consultancy, and I am here to ask Claire a few questions about her, about her talks. I'm going to sit down and let her talk again. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I spoke for a long time. I apologize. No, that's all right. <laughs> I think you know we don't get a chance every day to to host somebody with 25 years of experience in the real world out there. So are you, are you saying I'm old, Anna? I'm saying you're very experienced. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you made a couple of really great points, and I wanted to f ask uh, three follow-up questions um, that tie into that. Sure. So, two, two really great points you've made is that content isn't king anymore, and that distribution has taken the crown, but also that we still have moments of amazing TV that manage to captivate global audiences, such as Squid Game. Um, with that in mind, to what extent do you think audience follows great content? Um, I think great content is key, you know, and, and, and the right content on the right platform for the right audience. And, you know, Squid Game is a, is, a, is a great example of that because that is, to me, a distribution play. Netflix are in more homes around the world than any other SVOD service. So that's why people are watching it and because they garner audiences, communities of people who are talking about that show and sharing memes around that show across social media. So that is a, a you know, it may be a great show, uh, but it's a, it's a pure distribution play. But I also agree that creativity and great content are also, or, uh, also key. But you know, that to me proves the point of distribution. Absolutely, thank you. You also talked a bit about leveraging what you have to create sustainable revenue sources. And how IP and content um, that those in esports can and own and leverage for a sustainable revenue, um, but that you don't think that there is huge value in copying the formula of what we see on traditional TV for esports. 
in your opinion, what do you think um, are some of examples of content and IP that could work for esports? In other words, what would sh what should team or leagues be focusing on? I think people shouldn't be chasing this idea of um, getting into TV production and long form production, thinking you know there's gold in the hills. There's only gold in the hills if you hit on a winning formula. So if you create the voice or if you create X Factor, uh, then you know, th there's gold in the hills, but those shows are few and far between. The margin you make from creating a TV show is tiny. The money you make from distributing it is where most of your margin comes from, but there are very few hit shows. That said, esports is interesting because it's competitive, obviously. Uh, and most winning formulas for TV formats that have traveled internationally have been built around competition, the game show, because they're really easy to replicate internationally. You need a set, a theme tune, uh, and the theme tunes are worth millions, by the way. The Who Wants to Be a Millionaire theme tune, I think has grossed about, you know, kind of $5 million or something. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of competitive piece is a real w winning formula in TV formats. But at the same time, gaming is interactive and it's a multi-screen uh, experience and TV can't replicate that, which is why I worry about Netflix's gaming strategy. So nobody's done it yet with kind of interactive TV, um, you know, but, but they will. But it's just the way people consume content and tell, you need to tell stories to that audience is very different and it doesn't quite fit the way you tell stories in long form TV. So I don't have an answer for you, but I do think there's something around that competitive element that could be formatable in the future. That was very insightful. Thank you. I, I'm also not a creative, so don't ask me creative questions. Oh, no, that scratches my next one then. <laughs> um, we only have three minutes left, uh, so I have one more question for Claire, but I invite everyone with any follow-up questions or comments to join us next to the stage. Um, last one. In five to 10 years, you've predicted that there will be a wave of organizations from traditional media as they seek to merge distribution and content, but that's in 10 years from now. So where, in your opinion, is the smart money being invested today and tomorrow? Um, you know, a couple of things. Technology. Technology is always a good uh, investment. Technology platforms, ad tech, I think is a really interesting area at the moment. You know, seamlessly, cleverly, authentically integrating uh, advertising into sports generally, but into gaming and esports. Uh, betting, obviously, but also direct to consumer. You know, how can we own that direct to consumer? How can you own that first party data? in a world where first party data is suddenly really, really valuable. How can you create that experience for, for fans um, and, and keep them in, in, in one place? So, you know, all, all those things, I guess, are built around technology, blockchain technology, uh, you know, I think is a, a, a fascinating um, area in that space too. Very insightful, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your attention, for joining us. Claire Hangit.